have never been told I have a small voice. Can you guys hear me okay? Or should I use a bigger voice? You can hear me. All right. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Ruth and I have been friends a long time. Um, for those of you that are coming in now, or uh, maybe a little uh, just before we started, there are flash drives with all sorts of documents on it. Uh, feel free to take as many as you like. Uh, the documents are about climate and health. Uh, there are also brochures about the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, which I will be talking about in just a minute, and three pens, and they work really well. So. Uh, oh, and later we'll have a raffle for a book on pediatric environmental health and a journal. So, um, I'm delighted to be here. It's my first time at Villanova, and we're sister universities, Jesuit universities, and so um, uh, we uh, all uh, learn and work with values as our foundation, which makes it um, particularly nice. Um, I have been doing talks on climate and health for um, about 10 years, um, and we continue to learn more every day, uh, as long as uh, uh, our current administration in the White House will fund uh, research and uh, will believe in science. So, uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, we continue to learn a lot about how climate impacts our health. Um, I will uh, give you a warning that this can come, this information, there's a lot of information, uh, and it may, you may feel like you've been hit on the head by the end. Um, the idea is not to make you feel scared or overwhelmed, but as nurses, future nurses, to appreciate that a lot of the diagnoses and a lot of the illnesses we're seeing may in fact be related to the changes in our climate. And a lot depends on where we live, so in the Northeast, where we're at, uh, we're seeing a lot of precipitation. Today is a perfect example. And with that comes flooding and mold. And we'll talk a bit about uh, where we live as nurses uh, really should help us uh, understand how we work with our patients and our families and our communities to protect them and make them um, resilient to some of these changes. Please feel free to raise your hand. If I don't see you, just raise it and wave it. Um, I want this to be a dialogue, and um, as I said, it does come with a lot of pretty heavy information, uh, but um, it's all based in science, and it's all evidence. Uh, so I'm going to ask a question. How many of you know when Earth Day is? Okay, and when is Earth Day? Your birthday. <laughs> My birthday, which is April 22nd. All right. I'm going to ask that question at the very end. So, Earth Day is April 22nd in Washington, D.C. On my birthday, which is Earth Day, there is a march in D.C. to support science. So, if any of you are in the area, take the train down, and uh, I'll see you there. So, um, so uh, Ruth talked about uh, the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, which is the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. <coughs> this center serves the state of Pennsylvania and five other states. And uh, we offer uh, information uh, around anything related to reproductive health and children's health as it relates to the environment. This is my little commercial. This is who funds us. It's not only the CDC, but also the EPA. And our goals are to provide consultation and referral, as well as outreach and education. So if you need, need us to give a webinar or to come out and talk about something, uh, we're, your, we're your organization. Uh, the brochures in the back have our, our website, lots of free information for health professionals and families. Uh, we also do uh, consultation. We get calls, uh, lots of calls every week from families, parents, um, nurses, doctors about, gee, I have this patient. Uh, we, we had uh, recently, I took a call, family with four kids, three of the kids have um, autoimmune disease, and it seems to be coming from the mold in the kids' school. So how can we help them? What can we support? Uh, what sort of with information and letters, things like that. 
So we're a good resource. Please use us. And if you know anybody that has questions, uh, that brochure has our phone number on it. So you can see that we're in Region 3 uh, right here. And those are the other states that we serve. Uh, lots going on uh, related to uh, the environment. And today we're going to talk about climate change. So um, how many of you think climate change is human induced? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good, because it is. We're going to talk more about that. Um, I love this quote from Mark Twain, who says that climate is what we expect and weather is what we get. So, I work in D.C., I live in Northern Virginia. A few weeks ago, it was freezing cold out. Uh, after we had weather that was topping uh, near 80. Uh, this, is not, this is not normal, okay? And so, we look at our trends in our weather, and that predicts the climate that we expect. And so I grew up in the, the Midwest, the breadbasket right now of North America. But that breadbasket is moving north as we're seeing warming trends. So in the Midwest, in Illinois, where I grew up, the crops that used to be able to be grown can't be grown anymore, or uh, they're, they're having challenges. Uh, because the climate what we expect to see in the spring is different, right? So our springs come earlier, our falls last longer and later, so we have a shorter window of winter. We don't have the freezing that we used to have, and that's creating <coughs> issues around uh, our agricultural industry. So what is the greenhouse effect? And this is what's really creating the issues that we're seeing with our climate changes. So we have here, the natural greenhouse effect. We want a little bit of greenhouse effect to keep us warm, but what we're experiencing is enhanced greenhouse. So if you think of a terrarium, you guys might not know what terrariums are, but they're <laughs> popular in the 70s. Uh, they're plants that grow under this glass dome. When you have those gases trap the heat, so the greenhouse gases trap the heat, what happens is they don't reflect back off into the atmosphere that they come back to Earth. And so they warm everything up. Trees love greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, the more the merrier. Uh, so do some of our plants, which we'll talk about in a minute. <coughs> but for people, not so good. Uh, 10 years ago, there was a report put out by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. This is a nonpartisan group. It's a global group. And what they do is review all the science that's being conducted every so many years. And way back 10 years ago, they were raising uh, alarm that the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. unequivocal. Nothing that we've seen before, based on all of the records we've kept on our climate and our weather patterns. So what's happening? Well, um, we'll talk about the causes uh, in a little bit more detail, but basically we're creating uh, excessive greenhouse gases. Uh, and the biggest culprit is production of electricity through our coal-fired plants. And so coal, uh, coal production creates carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is one of those gases that creates this blanket that uh, prevents the heat from going back into the atmosphere. Other sources are agriculture. We'll talk about what specifically in agriculture is creating the greenhouse gas of concern. Commercial and residential. Uh, when we turn our lights on, we don't turn them off. But also uh, production of uh, concrete, cement, uh, produ pr uh, produces uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, industry, as well as transportation. So every time we get in the car and we drive somewhere, those emissions create greenhouse gases. And we'll talk about that uh, as well as we move along. <clears throat> so carbon dioxide is the, the, uh, the greenhouse gas in most abundance. Um, it comes from burning fossil fuels right, through our cars, uh, also to produce electricity, burning gasoline, cutting down and, and burning trees or other vegetation. So we have a lot of concern, particularly with massive uh, cutdowns in our forests, particularly the rainforests, 
uh, as well as some industrial and manufacturing pro processes, such as producing cement, which I said earlier. So once that gas is released, right, you go, you run to the store to buy a carton of milk, you come home, whatever is emitted through your car lasts in the atmosphere from 50 years at minimum to thousands of years. Thousands of years, it doesn't just go away. And we don't see it, so we don't really think about it. Thousands, up to thousands of years, that gas stays in our atmosphere. <coughs> The next greenhouse gas of concern is methane. So I grew up in the Midwest and we would vacation from Illinois to Wisconsin. And my dad would say, oh, open the window, smell that fresh air. <laughs> well, what we were smelling was uh, a lot of methane from the cow, cow pies um, uh, scattered throughout the, uh, the farms. But um, also the livestock, um, as they they burp and belch, um, creates methane. And so, um, again, these gases stick around for a while. Um, other sources, landfills. Uh, again, when I grew up in Illinois, there was a golf course that was built on a landfill, and you could routinely see flames coming out of the, the, the uh, mouth that they created for the golfers. And uh, eventually, they decided to recycle that methane to heat the homes around the golf course, which, of course, they paid a lot of money for <laughs> around the landfill. Um, but uh, trash breaks down and releases methane. It's, it's, it's consistent wherever there are landfills. Uh, producing and transporting natural gas. So uh, in the last lecture earlier today, we were talking to uh, a Region 3 um, environmental health scientist about the fracking. So when that natural gas gets transported, that creates methane, methane as well as there are coal bed methane pockets. So when that, they are drilling for natural gas through fracking, a lot of that is released. Uh, again, cutting down and burning trees and mining coal. And so how long does it stay in the atmosphere? Not as long as carbon dioxide, 12 years, but it has over 20 times more heat trapping capacity, 20 times more than carbon dioxide. So even though it only lasts in the air about 12 years, it still is much more uh, powerful in trapping those gases. So methane is a really important gas to think about. Nitrous oxide, and this is the last uh, greenhouse gas we'll be talking about. There's, there are, there's another one, but uh, is not as um, uh, important. So nitrous oxide, um, where does it come from? Well, when we put fertilizer down in the spring, filled with nitrogen, okay, uh, that will add to the soil and it will increase the gases uh, when we use it. Uh, fossil fuels, again, when we burn fossil fuels in our cars, and again, some industrial and manufacturing processes. Um, what do you suppose is going on here in that corner? What are, what's, what's going on there? Come on, nursing students. Doing surgery. What happens? They use nitrous oxide, right? During surgery. And guess what happens to the ni nitrous oxide? It gets vented directly outside, <coughs> okay? So it goes into the community, and it's a greenhouse <coughs> gas, and it lasts 114 years, but look at how many times more powerful it is than carbon dioxide, 298 times more powerful at trapping heat, all right? Now, Johns Hopkins in um, Maryland is doing some research in capturing nitrous oxide so that it doesn't go out, back out into the community. Uh, but that's the only place I know right now that's doing that. So uh, what we're, we're seeing trends over uh, a couple decades now is increasing magnitudes of warming, uh, which is increasing the likelihood of severe and pervasive impacts. 
Uh, this graphic comes from the EPA, uh, which up until January believed in climate change and that it wasn't a hoax. Uh, and it's still on their website, but I have to say that a lot of the documents have been removed, um, unfortunately. So um, we're not gonna go through each and every one of these circles, but what this should be telling you is that we have the greenhouse gases that trap energy, we end up with a warmer atmosphere, so then what happens? What are we seeing? And we might see all of these where we live, but we may only see a few things, right? So you probably heard there were tornadoes, pretty strong tornadoes in, in the south. Uh, you've heard of Katrina, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, so it's not that we, we haven't had hurricanes and tornadoes, but what we are seeing are stronger versions of those hurricanes and tornadoes and more frequent. So we're seeing hurricanes and tornadoes during, we saw tornadoes in February, that's unheard of, okay? So we're tracking the weather patterns and we're seeing a variety of changes in our atmosphere. And so when we see shifting ranges of wildlife and migration, they're moving out or moving in based on the trends in the weather. We're seeing rising sea level. We're seeing stronger storms. And so with that comes health impacts. And sometimes not physiological in ways that we can measure. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So I'm going to sit on this slide for just a minute because I'm assuming not all of you live, grew up in Villanova. Um, and so maybe you grew up in Colorado or Washington State. But I want you to look, this is from 2011. Uh, this comes from the NRDC, which is the Natural Resources Defense Council. And what we can see here are little blue sort of dashes, which is the <coughs> rainfall that was measured in this year. You'll see also these little red thermometer things. That uh, is record temperatures that were, was recorded. Uh, you might see these, uh, you, you probably can't tell from where you're at. These are snowflakes, record snowfall. Uh, you see these, uh, these uh, fires, these are wildfires, okay. And uh, then we have dark red areas, which is extreme drought and extreme flight. And you can, the Northeast is getting walloped. I have a very good friend that was just outside of Boston, and she took a picture of this week. <laughs> they have like three feet of snow. <laughs> and, I'm like, I'm going there May in early May. Will that be gone by then? Um, anyway, so so we have an idea, you know, kind of what's going on based on um, uh, NOAA and weather trackers. So to 2011, next year, the following year, 2012. All right. So what are we seeing? <coughs> We're seeing more wildfires. We're seeing more precipitation here, and we can't even see all the record temperatures because of the wildfires, but there's significantly more extreme uh, heat days as well, okay? Uh, there's also dark blue areas that we didn't see on the last map, FEMA declared disasters or emergencies. So I can tell you that I'm working with the EPA as director of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment. Uh, I'm working with US EPA along with a couple other um, uh, physicians to create a booklet, to update the booklet on wildfires because there are so many and they are so strong. Uh, the air quality um, is creating a lot of problems for people that live uh, within 50 or 100 miles, depending on the wind, from these wildfires. <coughs> and so we're uh, looking at children's health uh, women's health, as well as public health issues. Now, again, uh, this is not, I do not, uh, this is not a vision test. Um, the idea here is just to show you, now this is from February this year, NOAA, uh, who is uh, threatened to have severe cuts in their funding as well, uh, particularly around climate science. Uh, creates these, if you go to their website, you'll see daily, you can make a plug in your zip code and find out what's going on related to climate in your zip code. But here are uh, records that were broken across the world, so globally. Uh, we are losing um, islands, uh, 
uh, Native Americans, particularly in Alaska, because of the permafrost that's, that's melting. Their villages are built on these islands, and they're going into the water. In fact, you may or may not know this, and I didn't know this until I did a lecture in Maryland a few years ago, there's a whole island in Maryland that is no longer there in the last 10, 15 years. And they have photographs of the, the, the town and people moving and then the last shred of a house that was standing before it went underwater. Okay, um, so now we move into climate and health. And this is really important for nurses uh, to, to know. So whether you're dealing with people with respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, mental health issues, climate change impacts the, um, the prognosis of these patients, these families, these communities, and you have to be aware of how climate is impacting health. If you're going to be good at what you're doing and comprehensive in your approach. So, um, this diagram I noticed is still on the website at the CDC, uh, and I like it because it moves, but also uh, because it, it gives us sort of a big picture of what's going on with climate change and health. And we're going to talk about each and every one of these, so I won't go through these now, but we're seeing changes in vector ecology, so bugs, okay, and how they're transmitting diseases. Um, uh, allergens, so our springs come sooner. Uh, so in DC, we literally have one month where there's no allergens that are detectable. One month now. Um, <coughs> water quality impacts, we'll talk about that. Uh, when I was uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, there's something called algae blooms. Uh, they literally created brochures for people to make sure they would not, because Wisconsin is a, is a big agricultural state, they use a lot of nitrogen-based fertilizers. When the water heats up, it turns into algae blooms, which are poisonous. And they created brochures not just for people to make sure they don't swim in the water, but for pets who basically die uh, depending on the level of algae that's, that's in the water. So they created brochures for for people to be sure that their pets do not jump in water with algae blooms. There's other issues, of course, like cholera, which is a big deal, uh, but we'll talk about that too. Water and food supply impacts. Um, I just gave a lecture a few weeks ago around food security issues related to climate change, not just related to agriculture uh, and changing seasons and, and uh, having to change what we grow, but also how pesticides react to heat um, is also very interesting, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Environmental degradation leading to forced migration, civil conflict, mental health impacts, talk about those. Health, uh, excuse me, heat-related illness and death. I was living in Chicago during the big heat wave uh, in the 90s, we'll talk about that. And cardiovascular failure, uh, injuries, fatalities, mental health impacts, again, with severe weather, and then uh, air pollution. Uh, air pollution has been researched more than any of these others, but we're beginning to find additional health impacts that we weren't aware of as we continue to do more research uh, and as we're able to link health data with climate data more easily. So, air quality impacts. Um, one thing I didn't mention when we showed the, the uh, gases tracking the heat is that um, ozone level goes up when we have hot days, extreme heat days. Uh, so as the temperature goes up, the air quality goes down. So the hotter it gets, the worse the air quality gets. And it doesn't really matter where you live, it's worse in urban areas for the most part, unless pesticides were just sprayed in the rural areas. But as, as the heat goes up, air quality goes down. And I published some research uh, with the health department, the DC Department of Health, a few years ago now, and we found a significant increase in people being hospitalized, particularly kids and women. Um, when the temperature went up, uh, people being uh, 
hospitalized with myocardial infarctions, acute MIs, as well as asthma attacks. Oh, and we talked about the wildfire smoke as well. Uh, so vector-borne diseases. Um, how many of you have heard of Zika? Okay. So as our temperatures continue to warm, our ranges for our bugs are increasing, right? And so we're seeing expansion of Lyme disease, particularly in the Northeast uh, and the Midwest, the Upper Midwest. But we're also seeing diseases that we never recorded, recorded before, such as malaria in Florida. Now, uh, the other thing is that the mosquito that carries malaria and a lot of other diseases um, is found as far west as Montana. And so as the climate continues to change, uh, we're, going to be, we're going to continue to see expansion of these diseases. And, um, you know, it started with West Nile. Uh, does anybody know what this is a picture of? Pardon? Lyme disease. Lyme disease. Good, very good. This is the deer tip. And this is what, what you see after someone's been bit, right? Uh, and so, um, again, we need to be aware, and the best answer to all of this is, well, <coughs> the greenhouse gases, of course, but as a nurse is to help people uh, be resilient and protect themselves. So if they're going to be hiking, um, if they're going, if kids are going to be playing outside and there's bushes and trees, we need to be sure that they're protecting themselves. I'll never forget, I was, I used to volunteer for a, a summer camp for a friend of mine as a camp nurse, and the very first hike they did of the year, they came back and every single Girl Scout had ticks on them, and they were scaring around, and, and uh, sure enough, oh, two days later, somebody came in with <coughs> this bull's eye, and it was a 50-mile drive in this old jalopy that I had to take her to to get the, uh, the antibiotic. Um, Temperature-related death and illness, and um, there's been a lot written about this. Um, uh, because when we have extreme heat events, uh, as you might imagine, those that are more vulnerable, less resistant, are children, uh, adolescents, and the elderly. And um, as I said, in the 90s, I was living in Chicago at the time. Uh, there was a heat wave. This is actually a book written about it. And uh, what happened was the, uh, uh, there were hundreds of elderly people who died. Many of them were poor. They didn't have air conditioning or they couldn't afford it. They lived in unsafe neighborhoods, so they kept their windows down and they turned the fans on. And so what happened was they literally cooked themselves to death. Um, those of you that have been to Chicago may know they have a taste of Chicago and um, lots of food up and down uh, the lake. And um, what, there was an emergency because so many people were dying from the heat. They actually literally had to pull the food out of the refrigerators and put the bodies in because they were not prepared for the number of people that died in such a short period of time. Uh, they rallied and decided what they needed were community health workers to go to these neighborhoods with the next heat wave and let seniors know that there were cooling centers that had been set up as a result of this tragedy um, unfortunately, as things happen, uh, they're not as um, aggressive. Uh, it's been a long time now, 20 years. But um, many other cities uh, learned from this tragedy and have created cooling centers and a community uh, um, activation, mobilization when the temperature gets really hot. Uh, in fact, New York City, I believe, has uh, free air conditioners for senior citizens. You have to qualify based on your salary. Um, but um, anyway, who knows what this is? Where's that ID? Yay! Okay. And um, I was actually interviewed by the Washington Post several years ago now. Uh, the writer, uh, her son had been hospitalized multiple times as a result of poison ivy. And he kept getting it and she wasn't sure where he was getting it from. Anybody want to guess where he might have 
didn't get it. He was in the yard one day with a friend, and he had his dog with him. So what do you think happened? The dog had poison ivy oil and slept with him. So he would come home from the hospital, he would sleep with his dog, and then he would get reinfected. So what was happening, poison ivy is one of the plants that loves carbon dioxide, <coughs> loves it. And so if the leaves are larger, the oil is more potent, and so people who typically wouldn't get a reaction are getting a reaction, and sometimes those oils that normally wouldn't be um, harmful, like on a pet, um, are much more harmful. And so we're seeing an increase in, in people coming to the ER with extreme cases of poison ivy. Um, allergens, anybody know what this plant is? Ragweed, good. Yeah, smart. Uh, so there's been studies, scientific studies done under different um, levels of carbon dioxide. And what they're finding is um, we're seeing um, not only uh, increased pollination, but the pollen itself is larger, and the plants are larger, and they spread because they too love the carbon, extra carbon dioxide. And they're growing in places they didn't grow before. And so we're having uh, an increased prevalence of people who have allergies now. And so um, ragweed is, is becoming a huge problem. So, last but not, well, okay, this isn't last, there's one more last, okay. So this is, uh, is an article from Alaska, and I had the honor of uh, speaking with an um, uh, allergist, immunologist, about climate change many, many years ago, and he had conducted some studies because he kept seeing an increase in the number of people he was seeing in the ER, uh, in fact, some young men who had actually died from stings. So um, a big class of insects called Hymenoptera, which includes wasps and, and bees. What they were finding was because there wasn't the cold freeze, the hard freeze that they had experienced in the past, these little guys were not dying off and they were becoming super bees so that their stings were potent enough to kill people. And uh, I don't think I have any slides of the science, but one of the counties in Alaska saw a 650% increase in the number of people presenting in the ER with uh, bee stings, wasp stings, uh, hymenoptera stings. All right, last but not least, um, this is a young man, a football player, who died as a result of working out, um, you know, August is a real popular month for football teams to get back into the swing of things before school starts. Um, and his is unfortunately not the a nice, not an isolated situation. And so we um, we're seeing um, football teams and coaches changing their strategies so that um, after an hour or two, depending on how hot it is. Uh, the young men come inside, either take a shower, hydrate, um, and then go back outside. Uh, and uh, there, there have been many articles written about um, how this has really, um, in many ways, disrupted what they've done for years. But because of uh, concerns about safety and health, um, they have to uh, rearrange uh, their schedules. Um, Water-related illness. So I gave you the story about Wisconsin, but this is really in any community. Um, agricultural communities tend to have uh, the algae blooms more than non-agricultural, but all of those nitrogen um, fertilizers we put on our lawn, eventually when it rains it goes into our drain and into our waterways. And so um, <coughs> Uh, there's something called cornmeal you can buy at most uh, stores for plants, um, corn gluten. It works to kill weeds and it works to fertilize your lawn and it's safe for the planet. Uh, check it out. If you have any questions, you can email me. Um, we're also seeing, um, because this is an algae bloom, 
Uh, we're also seeing beaches closed because of it, because of the uh, safety issues. But also when there's flooding, particularly the northeast, where we're seeing a lot of flooding, and also the southeast during certain parts of the day or if there's a full moon, um, uh, uh, lots of opportunities for uh, diseases such as cholera, uh, uh, other, other waterborne diseases that we're seeing. Uh, these also make it into the fish uh, that we consume, which is of concern. <coughs> We talk about extreme heat, but there are other extreme events. See, I told you you're going to feel like you're hit over the head, right? I told you that. Um, I see people's eyes like, oh my gosh. Um, so we see a lot of flooding in the southeast and northeast around the coast, but also in Texas. Uh, we also are seeing extreme storms where there's loss of life, loss of home, loss of jobs, and in some cases, loss of community. When Hurricane Katrina hit, um, I remember I was living in Wisconsin at the time and listening to the news and there were planes and loads of people from New Orleans being sent to the Milwaukee area um, to start their lives over because they'd lost everything. <coughs> Food safety, nutrition, and distribution. So, um, as the temperature goes up, we have concerns about storing food, right? And most of us probably own a refrigerator. Um, but if we're having a picnic, if we're, if we're eating outdoors, it creates um, opportunities for um, uh, problems with, with our food. Uh, but also, um, as I said earlier, we have issues around uh, droughts and flooding. Um, patterns of weather that we're not used to and we're not able to grow our foods because of it. Uh, and um, outside of our country, we have huge issues around drought. Lake Victoria in Africa is shrinking. Uh, people have to, to walk miles, 50 miles for water. Um, there are a lot of conflict around that and even within our country, uh, this is probably 15 years ago now, there's a lot of um, conflict in uh, Arizona uh, because of water, uh, issues around problems with water supply. Uh, New Mexico uh, was trying to build a water pipeline from the Great Lakes to their state. Uh, and the Great Lakes mayor said, no way. <laughs> and they created a Great Lakes compact of mayors so that they could protect that water for their states. Uh, so it's happening, you don't hear it in the news very often, uh, but particularly in the Southwest. Uh, my son lives in Washington State. He bought some property, wanted to build a house, was told he couldn't drill a well because there was a moratorium because there wasn't enough water uh, to support that county and new, new building. <coughs> so they have property and they can't build their house because of drought. And this is a huge county in, in Whatcom County in Washington State. And it was upheld by the Supreme Court in the state. Um, up here is a fish that literally um, dried up in the lake. And this, this was a drought in Texas a few years ago. Um, and so these things are happening. We may not hear about all of them, uh, but they are happening. Mental health and well-being. Um, as you might imagine, um, if you lose your home, you lose your job, you lose your community, uh, you lose people that you love, um, it creates mental health issues. Um, uh, just uh, published an article with um, a couple nurses on mental health that's going, it's coming out this month in AJM. It actually may be out um, And one of the things I learned, which was not good news, is that child abuse goes up um, uh, two times when there's an extreme weather event, any kind, whether it's wildfire, whether it's flooding, whether it's extreme heat. Um, children two years and younger, uh, they see a significant increase in head injuries. Now who would think that child abuse would be associated with climate change? Not me, that was a surprise for me. Also domestic violence goes up and uh, violence and crime, of course, um, and the, particularly when the temperature goes up. Uh, so there have been uh, studies since Katrina around post-traumatic stress disorder, 
uh, as well as depression. And it's, uh, they're finding significant increases in PTSD years after experiencing extreme weather events. So we talk about populations of concern. We're all impacted by climate changes. Uh, but those most vulnerable include children. Um, you know, they count on adults to take care of them. Uh, they need to know that their communities are resilient and have plans of action depending on what that community is most likely to experience, whether it's wildfire, whether it's flooding, whether it's uh, um, whether it's um, uh, extreme heat. Uh, and so uh, kids are particularly vulnerable. Uh, Low-income communities are particularly vulnerable. Uh, when, um, uh, so you may have read a lot about Katrina, uh, but uh, that tragedy should not have happened. Um, I know somebody who actually worked with <coughs> engineers um, in uh, the walls. They were told years ahead of time and months ahead of time that those walls would not hold up. And guess what? They did not hold up. And so, uh, and the people that were stuck there were people that did not own vehicles and could not get out except for public transportation. And so uh, when we say, well, why did people stay? Well, some people stayed because they wanted to stay. But a lot of people were stuck there because they couldn't get out. Um, and elderly. Elderly are not able to adapt to heat as quickly. Their medications do not work as well. Um, uh, or sometimes are supercharged, depending on uh, what the medication is. So we have to be mindful that when we have extreme temperatures, that those medications may not be working at the same uh, level. And uh, finally, Native Americans. Uh, Native Americans live from the land, right? They count on fresh fish. Um, you know, they count on uh, their, uh, their homes, um, uh, whether it's an island or whether they're out in nature um, of, of being safe. And um, unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of these Native American communities decimated uh, by these climate changes. So vulnerability includes um, infants and toddlers, school age and older children, moms and babies, uh, but also, uh, as I said, the elderly. So if you picked up a flash drive, you will have this document, The Impacts of Climate Change on Human Health in the United States, a Scientific Assessment. Um, this was put out by a, uh, a group uh, which has global change in its name. Uh, the new administration has removed that from their name. Uh, but the document is still online um, if you want to look it up instead. And uh, it is, was published last year, so it's got very current information, uh, additional details of what I've covered today. Also on your flash drive is a copy of the uh, Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Ruth and I are members of that group. Well, I think is too. Um, this was just written and is published online, but it's also on a flash drive. Uh, it talks about climate change, health, and nursing, a call to action. Uh, this is a result of a White House event, the first ever, of, nur of a nursing group um, concerned about environmental health, specifically climate change. Uh, it was a group of 20 or 30 nurse leaders uh, that learned about climate change and um, uh, advocated with their legislators about <laughs> keeping this um, important health issue at the uh, front lines. We need to remember that nurses are in a unique position. We are the most trusted health professional group, actually the most trusted professional group, with the exception of 9-11 when it was firefighters. <coughs> the only year we lost. But every other year for a long time, many, many years, nurses have topped the group as being the most trusted health professional, most trusted professional. We do not use this power to speak for those people who don't have a voice, children, elderly, those who are poor. We need to become active. 
We need to call, we need to write letters, we need to do it because we are losing ground every single day. Nurses have been impacted in health through a focus on environment in practice, research, education, and advocacy <coughs> efforts, and we need to increase these efforts quickly, and I can't see how much time I have anymore. <laughs> How much? Yeah, okay. Ten minutes. Okay. Uh, so the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments is the only <coughs> national group of nurses that work with environmental issues. The only national group. And this group was started. 2009. It was 2009. Okay. And. Um, the group is divided up into work groups, right? The organization is divided up into work groups based on an IOM uh, <coughs> report, Institute of Medicine report from 95. And so one of the things we focus on is education uh, as, as this national organization. There's a free textbook right here. It looks like this. And um, it covers a whole range of topics. In addition to climate change, there's a chapter on lead and chemicals, and um, and so uh, please check it out. Uh, you will see Dr. Levy, McDermott Levy is one of the editors. It took a long time to pull this together, uh, but we really need, we're really encouraging faculty to integrate environmental health issues into their curriculum, and it's appropriate for any specialty area in nursing, any specialty area, not just public health. Um, research. Uh, so we need to consider how we're going to integrate climate change and its impact on health. This is actually not a research article that was published, uh, but um, it's an editorial. Uh, but uh, uh, conducting research. Nurses do very little of this right now, but we're, we really should be doing it. And we can use, so I published some research, uh, well, a few pieces of research around climate change and use existing databases. So my IRB was simple, and you crunch the data and you publish, and it's pretty easy. It's uh, not good to find things, but it's easy to do. Practice, so I talk about air quality. So when the heat goes up, air quality goes down. There's something called the EPA uh, Air Quality Flag Program, and we can, for $100, you can get a set of flags, and you can see me if your school, uh, kid's school, or whatever might be interested in it. And um, what we do, part of the, this is part of the Mid-Atlantic Center for Children's Health and the Environment, is we talk to school nurses, and we say, you want to institute this? We'll provide information, flyers, and flags. The kids, these are fourth grade kids. Actually, Gina McCarthy last year, EPA administrator came out and congratulated them. Um, green flag goes up if the air quality is excellent. Yellow if it's bad for uh, 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 highly sensitive people. Orange for sensitive people like anybody with asthma uh, or heart problems. And then red or purple. Purple is like Beijing bad, right? So we, we never had to fly that one. But the day that Gina was there, the orange flag went up. And this coincides with the EPA's air quality index that is free online. If you go to airnow.gov, you can find out what your air quality is. You plug in your zip code, and it will tell you. And you can get a text every day. I get mine at quarter to four every day to tell me what the air quality is in D.C. And why is that important? Because we want kids to go outside and play, so they're not fat, obese, but if it's 95 out, and little Johnny has asthma, he shouldn't be outside. So working with teachers, working with principals, working with parents, working with kids and grandparents is important. So they understand that environment impacts their health. Right? We don't, put, we don't connect the dots very often. Last but not least, we work on advocacy as uh, this national group of nurses. And this was this was the day when we had the White House event. Uh, I can tell you, Katie and I last week were at a rally um, to um, oppose the executive order against 
um, the clean power plant, which helps reduce pollution, improve air quality. Uh, and so uh, uh, Katie and I live in the D.C. area, so it was easy for us to rally and be there. It's going to take us not just working with nurses, but with all disciplines. And sometimes disciplines you wouldn't naturally think of. I'm not talking about other health professionals. I'm talking about engineers who can help us with water problems. I'm talking about architects who can help us with green buildings. You guys have a great green building here. I am talking about farmers. I am talking about people, unusual and unlikely partners that we need to work with to help reduce greenhouse gases and to help communities be resilient. Actually, I don't have a slide, but Georgetown Climate Center, if you go to just Google Georgetown Climate Center, you can find out what your community's climate adaptation plan is. Now, some cities have plans if they've had flooding, um, but um, you'd be surprised at the variation based on state how serious they are about getting their communities prepared and protected against some of the climate changes they're seeing. So the way forward is really looking at systems, helping individuals and families and communities, but even broader than that. Um, it's looking at engaging those people um, that can help us. It might be a business. It might be a farmer. Um, it's looking at green design and resilience. It's looking at educating the public so they're aware and they understand uh, that climate changes and health are serious business. And finally, there's something called See First. For those of you working in environmental justice communities in particular, but anywhere, um, it's free, it's put out by EPA. Again, you plug in your zip code and it will tell you all the chemical industries, how the air quality is, how the water quality is, if there's any super fun sites. Um, it's very informational. And I used this years ago when I moved into the DC metro area because I wanted to be sure that wherever I was moving, it wasn't terrible. So I knew the air quality was bad, but everything else was okay. So, eh, can't have everything. So ultimately our goal is to do no harm, right? Not just for ourselves, for, but for our planet. We need our, we need our wildlife to survive. We're all part of a web. And so even if you don't care about society in general, which I doubt because of nurses, think about the animals, think about how important this is for all of us. And that's it.
I'm actually a school nurse. Um, school nurses actually for recess are usually the ones who ultimately make the decision whether they go out for recess or not. So do you go, do you do any like PD type things around schools at all? Like do you, or do you know of any um, good resources? So there's going to be a free webinar May 9th uh, from 2 to 3. Um, we will be sending it out. I'll send it to Ruth. Uh, we have a save the date. Um, uh, my center manager is on vacation, and so we don't have the registration link yet. Uh, it will be available for CEs, and you can put in for a free uh, set of flags. And so please spread the word to other school nurses. It, you don't have to be a school nurse. Um, we have libraries do it as well. Any community. Uh, where there's a, a, a strong community presence um, will work. So, so I have two things to give away. And uh, first I have to ask you a question. Um, how many of you think climate change is caused by humans? Okay. And how many of you are surprised at how many health impacts there are? Are you surprised by how many things? Okay, good. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask a question. Whoever raises their hand first, and I see them, will get this lovely copy of Pediatric Environmental Health. All right. Um, what causes algae blooms? Yes. 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 